Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one we are going to head to Norway and we're going to have a look at a collaboration beer between two of the best known Norwegian craft breweries and I've had good experiences involving both of these guys so far. This beer is quite special though because apparently it's the most dry hot IPA that has ever been produced in Scandinavia so far and I'm filming this review for you incidentally on the 2nd of October 2019 so maybe this one will be beaten at some point but so you know as of uh, October 2019 this is the most dry hot double I uh, the most dry hot IPA ever produced in Scandinavia so far so for this review we are going to go to Amundsen Brewery in Oslo who are the home brewery and this is a collaboration beer that they've done with Lervig Octia Brewery who come from Stavanger it's called the even more cowbell an ultra hopped IPA at 7.5% ABV and it's supposed to be pretty damn good actually so very curious to see how this one turns out so um, yeah hopefully it's a good one and I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this beer as well I've had very good experiences involving both of these breweries before the Space Tiger is probably the best IP I've had from Amundsen so far and uh, Lervig Active Brewery I have had some really nice IPAs from them but probably the most noteworthy beers that I've had from Lervig have been the likes of the Three Bean Stout and, uh, and things like that it's probably, it, probably in fairness it is the this Imperial Stouts that would spring more to mind if I was asked about Lervig Active Brewery but both very very good breweries and hopefully this is another really good Norwegian beer the craft scene in Norway is pretty damn strong just like in Sweden and in Denmark uh, as far as my experience goes but um, yeah I hope you guys enjoy my take on this beer very curious to see how it turns out and uh, we'll see how we get on so as is usual with my reviews I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer if you want to get straight to the tasting just fast forward all the usual links are in the description below that's the brewery websites the links to my other reviews that I've done both from Amazon and Brewery and from Lervig Arctia Brewery. No doubt I'll review more from both of these breweries at some point fairly soon. There's all the usual social media. If you want to see more beer reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The whole channel has a geography based tagging system, so you can go into the home page and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, whatever it is you're interested in. Do check out the playlist of beers from different countries. There is one there for the Norwegian beers that I've reviewed for you, and that's being added to whenever I get the opportunity. You will find this beer review in there. And as always, please do get in touch and let me know some of the other beers and breweries that you guys would like to see me review. It's always great to hear from you guys that are watching the videos and the support that you show the channel is hugely, hugely appreciated. So anyway, to tell you a little bit about the breweries then, on to Amundsen Brewery first off since they are the home brewery. So Amundsen Brewery, as I mentioned earlier, are based in Oslo, the capital city, and this brewery is part of the Ackerhus Group, which owns a number of bars and restaurants around Oslo. And the main men in this company are Ole Johan Tollefsen, Bori Jensen and Tom Eric Andreessen. And the first brewery was part of a gastro pub in Stortingsgata and it was just a very, very small operation and the key man in getting this operation off the ground, if you like, was Tom Alfred Oimo who had been a home brewer for a good number of years and you can actually find this little pub just next to the old town hall in Norway and I was there with uh, with Michiko when I was up in Oslo and hopefully I can get back there and film a little out and about video. Um, but the brewery expanded and by 2015 they were producing around 200,000 litres of beer per year and they've become quite established and well known within Norway having opened up a larger brewery in Nydalen. But in 2016 the parent company purchased the property company Halketo Eindam and with this they, are, they acquired the Bjorna Divine 14 property in Halketo in the south of Oslo and this was turned into a 3,500 square metre brewery and the brewing began there in late 2016 and the new brewery capacity is around 1 million litres of beer per year. But the brewery equipment that they have came from Braucon in Germany and the canning and bottling lines came from Italy and apparently <coughs> The total investment in this site was around 16 million Norwegian kroner. Um, but the managing director of the brewery is Jeffrey Janssen van Vuren, and Matthew Thomas and John Hudson are also involved in the daily running of this brewery. And the artwork on the cans is designed by the American Peter John de Villiers. And it's probably one of the more distinctive artworks that you're going to find on a lot of the... Uh, on a lot of the different craft beer brands of course I mean you've got things like Three Floyds which is very distinctive and uh, Mikeler of course they've got their things that are very well known and uh, the Amundsen cans of course are really quite distinctive and pretty as well so you know I always like that you can always spot the Amundsen beers a mile away I wish I could review some of these more regularly because they are quite a prolific brewery as well and I think it's fair to say with these guys that they probably are better known for IPAs and things like that these days I don't think I've actually tried an Imperial Stout from uh, 
from Amundsen Bravery, so I'll need to keep an eye out and see if I can get a hold of one. I don't think I've had anything from the dark end of the spectrum with Amundsen, so that's something that definitely needs fixed. But Pardon me, that's all you really need to know about Amundsen Bravery for the moment. If you want to learn more, of course, check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with the latest goings on. And, uh, of course, you can check out the Rate Beer and Untapped pages as well to have a look at all the different beers that they've done. A very prolific brewery, like I said. So, anyway, on to the second of the Norwegian breweries, Lervig Arctia Bravery, who I've reviewed many beers from. So, Lervig Arctia Bravery are based in Stavanger in southwestern Norway, and the company was founded back in 2003 after the Toa Brewery was sold to Carlsberg and subsequently moved their production to Oslo. But for a while the Lervig beers were produced at the Mac Old Brewery up in Tromsø in the north of Norway. However, production was moved to Hilevog in Stavanger back in 2005. So the head brewer for Lervig is Mike Murphy who has been there since 2010 and prior to this the brewery were just making many light lager beers and things like that but Mike moved them towards making more American style beers and Mike had actually played quite an important role in the Danish craft beer revolution and he collaborated with the likes of uh, Mikkel and Jeppe Bjerg, so Sean Hill and also Andreas Kiesmeier as well. But he also worked for Bira del Borgo in Italy for a while, but now he owns 5% of the shares of the uh, of the Lervig Arctia Brewery and the main owner of the company is Christopher Stensrud who owns 67% of the shares and in total this brewery now exports around 20% of all the exported beers from Norway so for a craft brewery that's a pretty damn impressive market share actually the Norwegian beers you know to have 20% of the export beer market as a craft brewery from Norway is pretty damn impressive actually I don't know what brewed the only other one that I can think that's maybe comparable to that might be for example Brewdog in Scotland, but I mean, even at that, most of our exports would probably be whiskey and things. So I don't know what market share Brewdog would have, but I think Brewdog aren't on the same level as uh, Lervig Arctic Brewery anymore. But um, yeah, another very, very good brewery. As I say, my favourite beers that I've had from these guys so far, probably the Three Bean Stout is the best one. I've had some really nice IPAs and a few other different... Um, Imperial Stouts too, the Saskatoon Blueberry Cheesecake, I think it was called. That was another very, very nice Imperial Stout. And to be honest, if people ask me about Lervig after Bravery, I would say the Imperial Stouts are uh, probably my favourite beers I've had from them. But that's to take nothing away from the IPAs. The IPAs will always be pretty damn solid as well. But um, yeah, that's all you really need to know about Lervig after Bravery. Again, if you want to learn more, check out the brewery website in the description below. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that. And of course, you can check out the Rate Beer and Untapped pages for um, for the, all the different beers that they've produced because again these guys are a pretty prolific brewery but yeah let's get on and actually have a taste of this beer then I'll just let you have a little look at the artwork of this one before we open it up but there you can see absolutely beautiful artwork once again you know as I said these um, cans that are produced by Peter John de Villiers they're very very eye-catching and it's very very distinctive in fact um, so this beer like I said it is a 7.5% IPA um, this one from what I understand the hops in this beer are uh, where is it it is Citra Mosaic um, it's got Citra Mosaic Idaho 7 um, Enigma Tomahawk and I think there's some Simcoe in there as well. It uses a London Fog ale yeast. It's got an English ale yeast in there as well and there are oats and lactose in the uh in the malt base with this one and as well as just malted barley. I think there's Amarillo in here as well, I can't remember if I mentioned that. But yeah, 7.5% ultra dry hopped IPA this one, 440 milliliter can. This was actually one of the more expensive beers that I've bought from um, from Seistenbolaga. This one cost 86 or 87 crowns, so um, quite an expensive beer this one, but I really hope that it's worth it and I was told that this is one that I really, really need to try. So without further ado, let's get it out and we will get on with the tasting. So yeah, we'll get it out and into the glass. And I mean, that is one of the things, 87 Swedish kroners, you know, you're talking, what would that be? Be about 8 euros or something for the can, maybe £6.75, something like that. I mean, compared to, that price is about what I would pay for a Norwegian beer back home in Scotland, but you would expect it a little bit cheaper than that in Scandinavia, in fairness, but from what I gather, the importer kind of 
fire the prices up on uh, say Stemble Agate. So, but yeah, it's a one-off, you know, why not? It's good fun. But yeah, um, as you can see with this beer, if I hold it up to the light, I would say this one is definitely more of a yellow-leaning New England IPA. You can see if I put my fingers behind the glass, it is really very, very hazy. One or two big bubbles sticking towards the side of the glass, a few little ones heading up towards where the bottom of that head would be, but nothing overly surprising about this beer. Incidentally, the head is just faded away to be a very, very thin foamy layer. Um, one or two, you know, you can see a few of these little bubbles just heading up towards the bottom of the head there, but you know, overall it does look um, it does look pretty nice and kind of how you would expect, to be quite honest. Um, yeah, nothing surprising about that. So um, yeah, let's take a closer look at the aroma then and just uh, see how we get on with this one. Nothing surprising about this beer in terms of its appearance. It looks exactly as you would expect from a New England IPA. Oh, that smells kind of ridiculous, to be honest. So straight away with this beer, you're getting all these lovely kind of hoppy notes out of it. The malt base, though, actually does push its way up and have a good presence. I would say you can really pick up a bit of the lactose there. The lactose is kind of interacting with the fruits and making them appear almost a little bit... I want to say almost like a kind of fruity milkshake -y kind of thing. You can really get that out of this beer. Um... But yeah, you can smell the oaty creaminess in there as well. I want to say there's a little touch of a biscuity sweetness in there. I always find you get a little bit of a biscuity sweetness with these um, with these New England IPAs. But really, it's all about the fruit and the the hops in this one. You've got a really nice sort of grassy floral character, floral quality to this one. Um, it's more more at the green side of the hops in this beer really lean towards the floral aromaticity rather than anything else. It does have a nice little bit of that floral bite. The Idaho 7 is supposed to give you a good little bit of a piney resin, but in fairness, I would say that this beer, it really is more of a... It really is more leaning towards the floral side of things. All of the hops in this beer will give you a good little bit of a floral quality, um, but it's... Um, it really is nice how all of that thing, how all of it goes together. On the fruity side of things, you've got a hell of a lot going on. You can really pick out some orangey notes, and that'll be both from the Amarillo. The Amarillo um, gives you a really nice, um, it gives you a really nice kind of oily orange, and the Mosaic is going to give you that as well because it's a more kind of tangerine, juicy quality in there. The Enigma, it gives you this lovely kind of white grapey quality, but you also get some kind of it's almost like cranberries and red currants and stuff out of Enigma. It's like Nelson Sovin, but with a bit of red fruit kind of added to it, and you can really pick up the white sort of green grapey qualities to this beer as well. Um, you know Simcoe. There's Simcoe and uh, Idaho 7 in this one. These ones will give you, um, if I remember rightly, Idaho 7 will give you a sort of peachy kind of quality. I don't get so much of the peach sh peachy sharpness to this one, but I really do get the um, the kind of passion fruit that you would expect from the Simcoe. Simcoe's always kind of a more milky, sort of almost creamy passion fruit, whereas Galaxy is a bit more kind of punchy and in your face. Galaxy seems to have replaced Simcoe um, in a lot of instances these days. But really, this beer smells absolutely lovely. For me, it's got a good little bit of an orange base to it and the green grapes, they're kind of forming the backbone of the beer and the more you smell of it, the more your nose adjusts to this one, I'm finding you're getting a little bit of those red currenty notes and red berries from the Enigma. You're also starting to get some of the juicier tangerine notes from the Mosaic in it as well, but you're also getting a little bit of a kind of, it almost has a little bit of a, um, how do you say, it's got a little bit of an almost kind of pineapple-y, apricot -y kind of thing to it as well, which is really nice. So to me, this one leans more towards, it does lean more towards the juicy end of the, the fruity spectrum, if you like. The fruits are lighter and more juicy, and but it does have a kind of quite solid orangey backbone to it, which is kind of interesting. So, yeah. As I always say, take a little bit of time and enjoy the aroma of the beer before you get stuck into it. But to me, this one comes across as... Um, is really quite um, juicy and fruity, but it's got a nice floral backbone and a nice kind of smooth smelling, slightly sweet malt base. But um, overall, really, really nice beer, this one in terms of its aroma. So take a bit of time and enjoy that. But this one is the Even More Cowbell, a collaboration between Amundsen Brewery from Oslo and Lervig Arctic Brewery from Stavanger, both in Norway. Let's get stuck in. Slange, skull. Yeah, that's pretty damn good actually, I have to say. Thumbs up to both breweries on this. I mean, 
you know, when you've had beers from both of these breweries, you know that if both of these names are on the can, you're going to get something that is very, very good quality. And um, I'm not, you know, I was expecting something good, but this is really pretty bloody good, actually. I like this one. This is, it probably, it's on the same level, I think, as the Space Tiger, and the Space Tiger was really good. That's probably the best Amundsen beer. I've had up until this point, and it's not that any of the others are bad, of course, but um, you will find a beer that just really hits the spot for you. And for me, this one in particular hits the spot because I love these big orangey um, IPAs. Even when it, when it comes to West Coast and things like that, Amarillo and Mosaic, you know, those are probably my favourite hops. And the same, I guess, I would say when it comes to um, you know when it comes to the New England IPAs as well. If you get a big orangey New England IPA, it's hard to beat that in my opinion. But I like Enigma and uh, Nelson Sovine kind of things as well. The grapey notes. But yeah, that's really quite nice. You can feel the level of hoppiness in this one. The green side of the hops is pretty. It feels pretty thick, this beer, which is kind of interesting. And you do want your New England IPAs to have a good little bit of thickness, both from the malt base and from the hoppy side of things. But with this beer, you really can feel it on the sides of your palate. It almost feels a little bit like dusty on the side of your tongue because of the amount of hops they've obviously put in this one. And of course, the hops will break up and everything like that. And the uh, quite a lot of them will sediment out and things like that. But you will still get... Um, kind of remnants of the hops in the beer, but you really can feel with this one on the edge of your tongue the dustiness of the hops in this beer. I don't know how many grams per litre it was, but I know some of the heaviest, the most heavily dry hopped um, beers, I think they can go up to about 30 grams per litre, but at some point, you know, if you're dissolving things in water, basic chemistry, you will reach a saturation point where no more will dissolve. So I really do wonder if there is a, a limit to how much you can uh, actually dry hop a beer before it becomes pointless. I would assume using the kind of chemistry knowledge that there would be because you just won't get enough water, you just, the molecules just won't get enough water to kind of, dis uh, you know, to separate and things like that, um, but you really can feel that sort of dusty quality on the, the edge of your palate with this beer, it's really nice. So yeah, let's try and break down the flavour of this one then, we'll stick the rest of it into the glass. This is going to go pretty quickly and that's one of the things about these beers. They can be beautiful but they're dangerously easy to drink. So yeah, in terms of the uh, the malt base then, it's pretty straight up. I mean, you get that nice kind of pale malty quality, that blankets the middle of your tongue. The further that you go into the aftertaste, you're going to, you can feel the oaty kind of creaminess come out and there is a little bit of a biscuity quality in the very sense of your palate. It might even be a little touch caramelly to be honest with you. You can pick up just a little bit of that in there. Um, but yeah, for me, the malt base, as I say, quite simple but quite smooth, but really the focus is on the kind of edge of your palate and the fruity side of this beer. You really can feel the sort of dusty elements of the hops in, uh, in this one. So back corners of the palate, there is a little bit of earthiness there. That one, pardon me, will be coming from the uh, from the mosaic, because mosaic will always give you that little bit of earthiness. And as you come further forward, it smooths out a little bit, but then you get the nice floral aromaticity, and that sits on the very kind of front corners of your palate. Um, you can really, you can feel that. I mean, Idaho 7 is supposed to give you a bit of piney resin. The other ones, I think, mainly are more floral and aromatic. I don't remember the other hops being so... Uh, and floor and aromatic. I think what they've done with this, because it did say that tomahawk was one of the hops, probably what they've done is they've used tomahawk as the bittering hop and then they've just gone wild when it comes to the, um, you know, the, the Amarillo, Mosaic, Idaho 7, Simcoe, and I think there was another one as well, the Enigma, rather, those other five hops. I think they've gone a bit wild <clears throat> when it comes to those, but they've used tomahawk as the basis for this one, because you can feel that the, and when you, the later you add hops in the boil in a beer, the less they kind of the less they affect the bitterness, but the main bitterness really is quite floral. So I don't know if the piney resins would um, come out in the flavour as much as the, the kind of floralness and spiciness that you'd get from tomahawk wood. So yeah, I can kind of understand why the, um, the kind of bitter side of this beer is as it is. I think most of the bitter flavour you're getting out of this is coming from the, the tomahawk rather than the um, the dry hopping side of things. It doesn't really have much of a pine resin quality to it, this beer, for me. There is maybe a little bit of a 
pine, there is maybe a little bit of a resiny, minty type freshness to this beer on the very front corners of the palate, but it's not kind of overbearing or anything like that. Um, it's not as prominent as it might be in a West Coast IPA or if you used something like Chinook, for example. But then round the very front curve of the palate, this beer is a little bit lighter and grassy, which is kind of what you would expect. That sort of freshness, mint, almost minty-like freshness that this beer has, spreads around the front curve of the palate too. But if you go behind the front curve of the tongue, that's where you get that nice oily bubble where the juicy, fruity esters start to push their way out of the beer. And for me, um, this one's got a hell of a lot going on actually, so um, let's just focus on that for a minute. Yeah. So if you go towards the back of your palate there, if you go towards the back of that oily bubble rather, you get that nice bit of passion fruit which you would expect from um, from the Simcoe hop. Um, if you move a little bit further forward it's a bit more oily orangey and that will be the Amarillo coming out and then further beyond that, that's when you start to get the lighter kind of tangerine notes and in front of that and kind of mixing in with it a little bit you feel the sort of white grapey qualities from the from the Enigma and almost on the kind of tip of the tongue there's a little, you know, mosaic can often give you this little tiny bit of blueberry and you can feel that right in the very tip of your tongue um, but you're also getting some of the kind of um, a cranberry, red currenty type things from the Enigma there as well. It's it's really nice how the fruity end of this beer goes together. The Idaho Seven, <clears throat> that's the one thing I can't really place in this because, like I say, that one's really you know going to give you more kind of peaches and things like that. And there's a little bit of an apricotty flavour in there. Like the more that this kind of um, the more that the, that you kind of focus on the fruity side of the beer, you will start to kind of think maybe there's a little bit of an apricot there. But maybe that's the you know it's maybe it's maybe me thinking about it that's making me think that that's there, but the Idaho 7 to me wasn't immediately obvious in the flavour, but the other hops were, but in fairness, I'm a bit more familiar with the other um, hops that are in this beer than I am with Idaho 7, but it's becoming more and more prominent, so maybe I need to see about getting a single hop ale and sort of learn to appreciate that hop fully. Um, but yeah, for me, Passion fruit at the back, more orangey as you come further forward, a little bit of that white green grapey kind of thing mixing in with it, and then on the tip of the tongue, you know, a little touch of blueberry, and then you've got the nice kind of, um, you see you've got a little bit of that, the kind of red currently red berry sort of things coming out from the... Um, from the Enigma and things like that. The Enigma, Enigma is a beautiful, beautiful hop. I'd love to try and brew like a Pilsner with that in it. I think that would be a really interesting experiment. But in terms of the flavour of this beer and the way the fruitiness goes, it really is kind of top notch actually. This is probably one of the nicest kind of blends of fruitiness that I've come across. But for me, it really hits the spot because I've always been a big fan of the orangey hops and also the kind of grapey ones like Nelson Sauvignon and Amarillo were always probably two of my favourite hops back in the day and um, this one kind of is it's sort of modernised a little bit. You've got mosaic in there as well to give you more orangey notes and then you've got Enigma which essentially is, um, you know, it has the Nelson Sovine things but a little bit of red current in there as well. A beautiful Australian hop that one. Um, so yeah, a really interesting beer in terms of this one. This one, um, if it comes to the New England IPAs, um, when I think about the West Coast IPAs, it was always the 1000 IBU that hit a lot of spots for me and um, from Mikeller. This one, this is probably the kind of New England equivalent of that, to be honest. This is definitely one of the 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 New England IPAs I've had that really just has hit the spot for me. So this one gets a massive thumbs up for me. Just remember, though, beer is subjective and different people like different things. But I really like how the fruity side of this beer comes across. And um, the hoppy side, like I said, though, this beer really does feel dusty. I mean, we'll talk about the mouthfeel now. So, um, overall, I would say that this beer is is at the very top end of mid-bodied, maybe the bottom end of full-bodied. Yeah, I think that's fair to say, kind of top end of mid-bodied, bottom end of full-bodied. Carbonation is very smooth. It's definitely not the creamiest of uh, New England IPAs that you're going to come across and it does feel a little bit kind of dusty but with the amount of dry hopping um, I, they must be at least 30 grams per litre or something like that they must have got, from what I understand they went absolutely wild with this beer um, but it really um, it really feels kind of dusty on the edge of your palate you will notice that with this one you can taste the sort of um, hoppy 
powder, like, I don't know how you would say the sort, you can taste the, the, the bits of the hops that have kind of dissolved and are suspended in this beer, because beer, I guess, the beer is a suspension rather than a solution, to be honest, you can feel the the kind of dusty parts of the hops sitting there, but it's really nice this. Um, it does have this kind of thick, dusty kind of feel. It's not one of the creamier New England IPAs that you come across, but in fairness, I wouldn't have said Amundsen are producers of some of the most creamy IPAs. They are, this one, if you are used to the Amundsen beers, you will be used to this. They're a little bit lighter, a bit, they are sometimes a little bit dusty, but this is the dustiest. Amundsen IPA that I've come across. I think the Lervig ones tend to be a little bit more lighter, clean and creamy, whereas the Amundsen ones are a little bit, they do, they're a bit more kind of dusty, if that makes sense, in terms of their mouthfeel. And this one is more like an app, is more of a, an Amundsen beer in terms of its mouthfeel. Um, but yeah, so mid-bodied, smooth carbonation, quite dusty in its mouthfeel, but a little bit of sweetness in the middle of the palate too. So there is a little bit of that malty sweetness in there. Um, in terms of IBUs and things, I'm not sure about this one. I think this one might be sitting around the 50 IBU mark, which isn't surprising with the amount of dry hopping and things that it has. They've probably blasted this beer quite a bit with Tomahawk to push the bitterness up before they've dry hopped it just to balance it out a little bit. So I would think that this beer is at least 40, maybe pushing 50 IBUs. Lovely juicy fruitiness to the beer. Like I said, a little touch of sweetness in the malt base, but overall, it's a really nice beer and for me this one hits a lot of spots because I love these um, you know the orangey notes and also the kind of grapey things that you get too and this one has both of those so massive thumbs up uh, from me on this beer so um, yeah I guess we just leave it at that for this one have a go at this beer for yourself it is a little bit more pricey but I think it is worth it at least for me it was because it hit a lot of spots for what I like in, uh, in a New England IPA so um, yeah try it for yourself and just see how you get on but both of the breweries involved here have a very good pedigree when it comes to IPAs and uh, I think if you like both of these breweries, you know, you will probably enjoy this beer. So have a go at it and just see what you think. The most heavily dry hopped IPA that's been produced in Scandinavia as of October 2019. So, um, so yeah, let's leave it at that. The even more cowbell at 7.5%. Ridiculously easy to drink, um, but... Yeah, one that you definitely want to have a go at and see how you get on. So yeah, let's leave it at that. Once again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are, both from Amundsen Brewery and from Lervig Arctia Brewery. No doubt I'll return to both of these breweries at some point in the fairly near future. There's all the, you know, check out all the usual social media. And as always, thank you for watching, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this review. Until the next time, slander just now, and I'll catch you soon. The even more cowbell, an ultra dry hopped IPA from uh, Lervig Arctic Brewery in Stavanger, brewed at Amundsen Brewery in Oslo in Norway at 7.5%. Slander, skull, cheers.